expect and the climate science shows us that these, these impacts are likely to continue to intensify or worsen in the future. Over the past century, temperatures have risen, growing seasons have become longer, precipitation patterns have changed, and extreme precipitation events have increased the frequency and severity of events. These all pose challenges to the agricultural sector. Um, these impacts have direct and indirect effects on production, profitability, um, and how we all benefit from the food that shows up on our table and the wide range of services that are provided by the agricultural sector here in the Midwest. We need to also think about how agriculture is a real opportunity and partner in helping us achieve the emission target reductions that have been set through things like the Paris Climate Agreement. We know the science shows us that we need rapid reductions in emissions in order to limit global warming to the one and a half degrees Celsius or 2.7 degree Fahrenheit target set in the Paris Climate Agreement. In order to do this, we need partnership, collaboration, and action in every sector. No single sector will, is responsible, nor every six, no single sector will also provide the only solution. So this is an all hands on deck cooperative opportunity. And tonight we're going to talk about how the ground under our feet, the material that helps put food on our tables and helps improve and provide clean water and offers a, can offer a range of climate solutions and environmental benefits. We'll explore how soil, something most of us don't think about hardly ever, um, is vital to our own health and is a key climate and environmental solution. So let's say we're going to have a discussion looking at the problem and the solutions from the bottom up. And tonight, I'm honored to be joined with an impressive range of experts bringing a diversity of expertise to bring to bear on this conversation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anna Cates, who is the soil, State Soil Health Specialist with the Minnesota Office for Soil Health and is an assistant professor in the Department of Soil, Water and Climate at the University of Minnesota. She studies soil organic matter dynamics and soil functions in cropping systems. She works with a broad spectrum of farmers, their advisors, local government, extension educators and others to promote practices that conserve soil health and improve water quality. We're also joined this evening by Kristen Weeks Duncanson, who is the owner and partner at Highland Family Farms located in Mapleton, Minnesota. Kristen and her husband raise corn, soybeans, rye, oats, specialty corn, and hogs. Kristen also works as a consultant with KCOE ISOM, an accounting and sustainability strategy firm where she helps producers and the supply chain collaborate on conservation and sustainability planning. Kristen is involved with many agricultural organizations, including serving as the current board member and former chair of the Minnesota Agri Growth Council. Thank you so much for joining us. We're also joined by John Jaskew, the director of the Board of Water and Soil Resources, who kicked us off this evening. John was formerly the Dakota County Water Resources Manager and the administrator of the Vermilion River Watershed and has held a variety of positions within the Board of Water and Soil Resources and the Department of Natural Resources. He has, a BS, he has a Bachelor of Science degree in Geology and Geophysics from the University of Minnesota and an MA in Public Administration from the Minnesota State University, Mankato. He grew up on a dairy farm in central Minnesota in Morrison County with 10 younger siblings, and he now lives in St. Paul. And last but not least, we're joined by Lance Klessig, who's a research resource specialist with the Nona County Soil and Water Conservation District. He enjoys working with Minnesota farmers as they implement soil health practices. He's a certified crop advisor and is experienced in cover crops, regenerative agriculture, and conservation solutions that protect our soil and our water resources. And so for those of you who are chiming in, before we dig into the meat of the conversation, you get to be part of this conversation, so please submit your questions to us. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, you can um, tweet at, at Minnesota Agriculture, or you can send an email with your questions to MDA dot communications at state.mn.us. So please feel free to add questions anytime throughout the conversation and we'll, we'll kick off with a series of questions and then we will be answering your questions. So please be sure to send those our way. All right, that was a lot of me and not enough of you. So here we go. Um, John, I'm gonna ask you to sort of kick off the conversation and provide some context. So. Um, as someone who, I am a geologist, but I don't think about soil very often. Um, and so I'd love for you to give it, sort of set the stage. So how do we define soil health, if that's even possible? But in your perspective, you know, what is soil health? And 
who benefits from from healthy soils? Is it just farmers or are there benefits that all of us Minnesotans um, get when we think about the idea of having healthy soils and making investments in healthy soils? Well, thank you, Heidi. Yeah, and you know, obviously farmers know the value of, of healthy soil, right? Because they use it to you know, make their living in essence, right? In Minnesota, we're actually very blessed with uh, with good soil, you know, we have, uh, and, and water too, right? I mean, those two things are gonna be commodities for the future of uh, the globe, frankly, that are gonna be important to preserve and enhance uh, for for forever maybe, I guess, right? Um, healthy soil is, you know, one could say it's a, the ability to grow something. I mean, that's, you know, a gardener would think maybe the same thing, right? And of course, people can go to the store and buy various things that make their soil better, whether it's uh, uh, making it, more porous so that more water can be held in it, whether it's, you know, adding some nutrients to it to allow the chemistry of the soil to grow plants better. You know, those are maybe one way people would think about soil health from a something they already know perspective, right? But now, soil is a natural resource, right? You know, that has become part of our state and of course the globe as well over, you know, eons, right? And in Minnesota, the, the soils that, that grow most of our crops, you know, were in the prairie landscape once upon a time, right? And that area of the state had a long history of, you know, plant growth and decay, plant growth and decay, right? And that's the primary way that soil is grown. And you'll hear more about this tonight, you know, that that's actually some of the things that we're trying to make sure we pay attention to now are, you know, management ways of doing some of the things that nature did, you know, kind of all by itself, I guess, you know, when there weren't any humans around to to be uh, needing the soil to grow the food that we have, the food, as well as the fiber, you know, uh, as well as, um, you know, fuel, right? I mean, so the the, the soil can produce a lot, uh, obviously reliant on the sun and, you know, all the other parts of our uh, ecological systems. And, uh, and Dr. Case can talk more about the specifics of that, but that's the way we, you know, think of it as citizens, I guess. And the ability to absorb water and to uh, to uptake those nutrients in a way that uses them instead of allows it to move, you know, into the water, for example, uh, is an important part of what we do as, uh, you know, agencies and practitioners in this area. So uh, I'll conclude, with, conclude my answer with that. Great, thanks. I see some nodding from our other panelists. And so I, if anyone wants to add some sort of attributes that you would use to sort of describe, you know, what is healthy soil? Does anyone want to chime in? Well, the NRCS definition goes back to the function of soil. And so I think that you can define your own soil health depending on what functions you're looking for. If what you're looking for is high crop yield, that's an important function. If what you're looking for is water infiltration, that's also an important function. Ideally, we have multifunctional soils, but I like thinking about soil health as being flexible depending on the function you want to get. Great. And I think sort of, John, you sort of, maybe this is something we can surface through the conversation, but you sort of alluded to that sort of connectivity, right? Like soil in one place has implications for, you know, the soil around it and the soil, right? So it, you know, sort of, we, we really are invested in and, and need to care about the sort of functionality and health, not just in one place, but thinking about really as something that's, you know, you know, connected. It's part of the system, as you said. Um, which I yeah, think. and it's a, it's a living part of that system, right? I mean, and that's the it's the both the good news and the bad news, right? If it's something that's living, you know, we can grow it to do more of what it was intended to do. If if we're not careful, you know, we can harm it as well, right? Because it's got that capacity to regenerate itself to some extent, right? But you know, once a certain point is reached, you know that it can no longer do that, right? So that's that's what we're trying to do here, and. Um, many of the things that, you know, maybe some people have heard about from the past or from the history that they've learned, you know, can at least trace some of that knowledge back to, you know, the Dust Bowl and, you know, the era of the 30s when, you know, substantial drought and a, you know, probably a lack of understanding about what soil really was led to some really catastrophic outcomes, right, where we, we lost a good bit of the resource that we had that we couldn't recover, right? And of course, it caused harm in other places because it's in the wrong spot. Now the, the soil is not doing what it was doing 
in the place it was formed, it's now, you know, down the river or, you know, blowing across the the highway or whatever it might be. And, uh, you know, those are signs of distress. And, uh, you know, not everybody's, uh, you know, probably looking at the soil and wondering what kind of stress it's under. But uh, the soil scientists that are on this panel and the practitioners, including Kristen, know a little bit about that, too. So thank you for the question, Heidi. Yeah, that's great. I think the idea of it being that it's living uh, really helps us understand why we talk about soil health. Um, you know, is it putting a personal spin on it, right? We look after our own health. And, and so you know, what does that mean when we think about soil as living um, and its health as, as part of this process? So I'm looking forward to digging into that question um, a bit further. So Anna, we're gonna pivot to you. And uh, we sort of now have an understanding for soil, its connectivity, you know, there, there's this element of health. Um, and we also was sort of led off, and this is part of a conversation series related to climate. Um, and so I'm hoping that you could give us just a bit of context around um, agriculture and acknowledging that it's not a monolith, right? It's a very diverse sector, um, but just broad brushes sort of when we think about climate and agriculture, um, what are the primary sources of greenhouse gases from agriculture? And then the second part of the question is really sort of shifting back to this lens around soil and, um, getting an understanding from you, sort of the role that soils play um, in being a sink um, for emissions or a source, a store, a place to sequester carbon. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about the sources and then some practices um, that we can use to reduce, say, greenhouse gas emissions and that potential for soils to be our friend and collaborator in our efforts to reduce global emissions. Okay. Well, agriculture is, of course, an enormous industry globally with a lot of diverse components to it. So you can calculate its greenhouse gas footprint uh, differently depending on kind of where you start and end the agricultural footprint. You know, did what I have for dinner count as part of agriculture? You could count it that way if you wanted. But uh, the main things that people tend to talk about are methane emissions from livestock, um, the emissions from nitrogen fertilizer production, which is pretty energy intensive, but really critical for keeping up global food supply. Fuel used for tillage and transport uh, within the agricultural system. And then this soil piece is the last one I'll talk about tonight. Um, is just the carbon mineralized from soil. So that just means that microbes in the soil break down plant carbon, turn it into carbon dioxide. This is a totally normal natural process. It happens everywhere. You wouldn't want it to stop. If it stopped, then you would have uh, debris from plants piling up for millennia and we'd be smothered, I guess. Um, but what we're talking about it today is partly because it has these co-benefits that we talk about with soil health more broadly. So soil carbon is a component of soil health. If you want to think about how to build carbon in soils, you can go back to what John talked about in terms of the prairie building the carbon in the first place. And systems that look the most like a prairie, and uh, essentially that involve roots in the ground year round, that involve pastures, and often systems that involve grazing animals like the prairie did, and uh, fire, because the prairie was managed by humans before white people started farming it. And there was fire and grazing involved in that process. And those do seem to help build carbon as well as just letting the plants grow. Uh, the other things that we talk about a lot in row crop systems when we're not using animals on pasture are reducing tillage and cover crops. And those tend to at least help us hold on to the carbon we have. Because it's important to point out that we've lost about half the carbon in our prairie soils in the Midwest since we started farming them in the 19th century. So just holding on to what we have is actually a great goal for us. Great, thank you. Um, Lance, I'm going to, or I guess actually, you know what, Kristen, I'm going to come to you here. And um, I, I want to understand from your perspective um, how soil health can help farmers prepare for extreme weather and, and the impacts of, of a changing climate. You know, what are, I guess, some of these co benefits? Um, if we sort of think about what are the co benefits to you as a farmer? Um, would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Heidi, and thanks. Um, and uh, I'm overwhelmed by the uh, the uh, knowledge on this panel beyond me. I don't have that much. I just live out here, so uh, this is good. Um, Anna did a great job of kind of describing what we try to do, not only here in our farm, but with our peers across the country. And I have the distinct pleasure of working with farmers from 
all over uh, through the AGREE project and some other things I'm involved in. But it's, it's a systematic approach as how we look at our soil and not just the working lands portion, but the uh, the part in the middle, but the um, the edges too. The uh, edge of field practices are, are extremely important as we plan how we're going to build that um, soil health to make us more resilient, whether it's about uh, loss through wind or la loss through floods or loss through other methodologies, we have to look systematically at what are we doing here? How are we managing those nutrients? If we have the opportunity to use our hog manure or, or our livestock operations, what does that mean to us? What does it mean to us also when we um, are looking at the, the ditches that surround our fields here on the other side of the field? What do those buffer strips mean? Wildlife habitats, all of that is a systematic approach to how we work out here and what happens and and having a healthier soil makes us less vulnerable so how do we reward that vulnerability less uh, risky behavior uh, with healthy soils and that's being more pro product productive because farmers do two things every single day try to work on how we're going to be more productive and how we're going to be less vulnerable reducing risk can be done through lots of different ways but protecting our soil makes us um uh, perhaps the most sense when we're talking about those two elements. But we get up every single day and think about those things, both on the business side and the practitioner side of what we do. So I, I look forward to, Lance has got a, a huge variety of experiences when it comes to these things too. So, and as uh, someone who works with a lot more farmers in Minnesota than I do. Well, thank you, Kristen. And, and Lance, that's a perfect segue. Would you mind sharing with us some of those um, so stories, those successes, and um, the work that you're doing and in, in helping to establish you know, good soil health practices here in Minnesota? Yeah, gladly. Um, so yeah, I have the pleasure to work with uh, farmers primarily here in the southeast corner of the state, but I also do get to travel across the Midwest. And uh, we have various tools at our disposal, whether it's you know, financial assistance, whether, you know, via like cost share where we provide money for cover crop seed and, and also, um, you know, the ability to use equipment like a no-till drill to, to plant the seeds right into the, the soil without disturbing it. Um, so, yeah, so we have lots of different tools, but one thing that I really enjoy is just being able to work directly with uh, farmers and what are their concerns about trying to implement more soil health oriented practices like like John was mentioning, you know, whether it's no tilling or it's bringing livestock on the land, incorporating cover crops, that type of thing. So, um, yeah, so I have lots of different success stories. I mean, I've worked with, um, I can think of one fa father son team that I started working with in 2017. They're very, um, boy, hesitant about what will cover crops work this far north? And can I get them in after my corn or soybeans are combined? Um, and so I worked a lot with the son, which is pretty typical, you know, he's about my age, mid thirties and, um, we got some questions answered. And then the next year we were able to get him 30 acres of, of cost share. And that took away some of the, um, you know, some of the risk that's involved with trying something new. Um, really. So they got the cover crops planted after harvest. It worked out quite well. Um, and long story short, uh, he got his dad involved and I did a video with them. Uh, last year and you know over half their acres are cover cropped and when I say half that's like over a thousand acres <laughs> so that's that's a substantial amount of of acres that didn't have like a living skin or you know uh, of that nice green cover crop there to protect it and to armor it so so there's one success story I'll share so yeah. that's great and and so I guess just to dig a little deeper there um, you, you're the sort of this protective skin, like, can you explain to us, you know, sort of what are the benefits? Like, how does it actually work? Like what, it, you know, there's the soil health benefits. And then I know Anna sort of mentioned co-benefits related to sort of water quality. Um, so when, you know, you're answering these questions and you're thinking about implementing and, you know, doing this experimentation, and of course it's, the, it, there's risk associated there, but, mm -hmm. you know, in this context of a success, like why was it a success? And, um, you know, what, what benefits did, did you see and, and did the, the farmers themselves sort of see? And, and is this something they're continuing, you know, interested in continuing to do um, now that they've sort of went through this, 
this one phase of the experiment. Yeah, for sure. So I think it is it is a process or there's a transition through the, you know, as we want to adopt cover crops and no till, you know, grazing, that type of thing. Um, so one thing that I when I talk about soil and think about soil is that, again, that protective skin of having a, an armor. So when raindrop come a raindrop comes flying out of the sky, it just doesn't hit bare ground and have an explosion and then, um, you know, crust over the soil. But there's there's residue, there's armor, there's a protection insulation there to to slow the water down but then also to help it um you know soak in or infiltrate and i think john you actually mentioned a little bit of that that's an important way to improve our water quality so we have um, less of that water running running off the field into the ditch or into the nearby stream carrying with it uh you know different pesticides and you know soil particulates so uh, lots of benefits um and we're also reducing flooding which impacts everybody, you know, our, our township, our county, our, our state highways. So there are some very significant benefits to uh, adopting some of these different soil health pr principles and practices. Yeah, Heidi, I just want to pick up on something Lance said, Please. which was about um, this question of runoff versus infiltration and essentially water behavior. You know, we really want two really diverse functions from the soil. We want it to ab absorb the water when it comes down fast. We want it to let it through the profile quickly in those intense precipitation events, which we know are increasing. And we also want it to store water for the long term. So right now, when we're having this dry spring, farmers who had more water in their soil going into their planting season are in better shape than they would have been otherwise. And so you need both of those functions. And the important way to get those is by building soil structure. The way to build soil structure is by not disturbing the soil as much and keeping the roots in place to tie things together, essentially. Roots also provide channels for water to go fast. But really minimizing disturbance and uh, keeping the roots in the ground do a lot to give you the structure that uh, helps us manage water in these kind of different extreme scenarios that we need our soil to behave well in. Great, thank you. Those are great visuals too. I think that really helps um, to sort of contextualize all of this. Um, and you know, I'm gonna kind of um, open this up really to anyone, uh, but maybe Kristen, um, you want to comment a bit here. And so we've heard the success. We also heard, you know, and you mentioned that you know, sort of every day you're thinking about productivity and reducing risk and vulnerability. Um, and then Lance mentioned, right, that this doing some of this soil health work and you know, in this example of the success of sort of cover cropping, it, it involves an inherent amount of risk where we're doing something new, we're experimenting. Um, we're not sure what the outcomes are going to be. And so you're adding in yet another layer of, of uncertainty or risk. Um, and so how do we sort of incentivize that or reduce the burden of adopting that amount of risk, right? So if there are all these benefits that we're talking about, you know, we're all connected to the soil, we're all connected to the agricultural sector. We just talked about, you know, this is a critical piece of reducing our exposure to flood risks. Um, right. But how do we acknowledge that contribution and incentivize this type of risk taking? Thanks, Heidi. Yeah, it's a really interesting scenario and we can't go with um, uh, out having a conversation about the culture of change. And the culture of change Lance mentioned uh, earlier when he was talking about one of the success stories is where his technical experience hit home first in a farming operation. Sometimes one of the folks that runs the farm has a bigger comfort level than another one within that farming operation. But within the neighborhood too, we have to think about the fact that oftentimes we don't own the land, all the land we farm. It's farmed with landowners that may live in, uh, I'm south of Mankato, so in Mankato or Minneapolis or Chicago, and they are two or three generations removed. So their knowledge of what's happening on this um, ground, or it's a retired farmer that that was quite successful, but has now retired and has a set of practices and culture within their mind that isn't um, fully aware of what um, some of the um, challenges are on the landscape now. So we have um, having the opportunity to have 
um, Lance's folks or Anna's research and all of what um, Bowser does as examples and models is super important. Data collection and technical assistance, the two things that really will drive change in a big way across the landscape. And one of the things we haven't done a, a great job of is instilling in farmers to collect data. What practice are you doing? How many acres and what happened? What's been that impact? How do you measure that impact? What's the change in your soil profile? Are you grid sampling? Who's helping you with that? So if I'm to put a plug in, yes, cost share is phenomenal when you're trying a new practice, but so is research technical assistance and, and the ability to collect data. Precision agriculture has been adopted by, I'd say, and I'm gonna, this is anecdotal more than based in AMS or NAS research, I'm going to say commercial farms are probably about, in Minnesota, 60% maybe have adapted. Anna probably knows this better, our Lance, pre precision agriculture. And that brings us some opportunities. But it's going that next step and figuring out, OK, how do I critically look at my business as well as my production from inside that business to make good decisions that is um, that is very helpful to have research and technical assistance. Uh, it, and the rest of the supply chain has a huge interest. And when I say supply chain, it's the folks we buy stuff from, as well as the folks we sell stuff to. They have an interest in doing this too. Um, and, and for farmers, it's trying to sort out where do I want to align myself and how am I going to work within that that um, operation for a long-term benefit for all of us. Civil society is eager for these kind of um, benefits on the landscape, but they sometimes need to remember it takes a bit of time. This is a biological system, not a light switch. So communicating all of that and using folks um, at universities and within soil and water conservation districts, as well as federal agencies becomes critical as we plan and move ahead into the next um, generation of soil health and, and technology of, of surrounding how we operate. Thank you. I love that. It's a biological process, not a light switch. I think that is that is so great. I'm going to I'm going to borrow that if you don't mind. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and I, so I think, you know, Lance, I'm going to I'm going to shift back to you and, and John and Anna, please, please chime in. Um, I think with that idea of this being a biological process, not something that we can flip and switch overnight in this this culture of change, uh, right, and this, this multi-generational um, process um, and knowledge sharing that happens. So how can we work towards, you know, scaling these solutions, but also, and, and again, that's making these smart investments in technical services provision and data collection. Um, but how do we work towards these sort of soil, soil health practices being, you know, self-sustaining? Um, you know, one way of describing that's like paying for themselves or um, I know we've discussed a little bit of, of Kristen sort of alluded to what we need. So my question is like, how do we do that? And, and how do we lead to, towards this being less risky and less work, um, I guess, if you will? Sure. Well, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at it and then I'll pass it off to all you. So um, I think that one component is fostering just really high quality educational events. And I'm talking about you know, not only workshops that might appear, you know, might happen in a, a classroom type setting, but also, you know, on farm, in field type um, settings where people are using cover crops. Maybe they're trying no till, maybe they haven't tried it. We have soil pits that we're able to look at, you know, physically look at the soil. And probably the most important thing is actually having farmers talk directly to one another. And what's working, you know, on your farm three miles from here or 40 miles from here. Um, what things have gone well, and then also, I don't want to say what things have failed, but what things have we learned from, and what things will we do different? So I think, you know, that educational component of of sharing of information, networking. Um, you know, I've been blessed to travel all across the Midwest with with local farmers to learn from, you know, regional or you know, you know, farmers in the Dakotas and whatnot, and that's been really helpful. Um, I was going to share one one example we have down here in the southeast. We have a a spring cover crop tour that we put together um, with seven host farmers and 
these are farmers that I've got to know over the last um, five, six years. And many of them are have had a lot of success with cover crops, but they've also had some uh, lessons learned that they're more than willing to share. And so um, the idea, we had, you know, some COVID restrictions and whatnot. So we, instead of having like a on-farm, you know, a field day on, you know, May 15th at six o'clock, we have a, a tour that is going from April through the end of July where um, a farmer and maybe his son or daughter or uncle, they can come to the, these specific sites um, with a wide variety of cropping systems and ma uh, management going on. And they can go out in, in, in these fields and dig and learn. And um, the host farmers, you know, phone number's there and it talks a little bit about what they're doing and why they're doing it, specifically their goals. So um, that's how I would answer it. I'll pass the baton off to one of you. So. Well, I can maybe add a little bit. You know, I, I'm glad Kristen brought up the culture thing because, you know, obviously farmers are seeking, you know, production and, and they're managing risk in accomplishing that. That's their sort of their business aspect to it, right? But, you know, there's this Hank Williams Jr. song that talks about tradition, right? And, uh, you know, sometimes what you do is based on who you learned it from. And, you know, that's what Lance is getting at, right? And, and that's okay, right? I mean, that is a part of what all of us do is we 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 learn from others and and having the confidence to make a change. You know, you, you that that's really also managing risk, right? And having um, the assurance that this has been something that somebody else has either tried or tested or that the university has evaluated gives me as a business person, if I'm a farmer now, you know, a reason to consider doing something that I hadn't tried before, and and that. I think farmers do in, in all categories of their operation. I, you know, I was never a farmer. I was just farmer laborer number one. But, you know, I know my father and our neighbors, you know, they were using the university as a way to guide them in not only the way they manage their farm on the land, but also in the business area. And so, um, again, making a business case for this is often one of the places that those peer-to-peer -peer relationships that Lance talked about can be most successful, right? Uh, you know, because uh, it takes away a, a fear, which is really just another form of a risk, right, that you can't define, right? So I think that's really, really important. So in providing this, you know, cost sharing, you know, or, or help with getting the practices installed, we also, along with that, and that's what some of the work that Lance is doing and his peers across the state and, and the private sector too, because as Kristen noted, farming has become a data intensive operation, right? I mean, and it's data that they themselves hold, right? And and using that data to make good decisions, including how to, you know, protect and grow our soil is I think one of the things that we think is really gonna be important to the scale up that this uh, whole undertaking hopefully is headed towards. Thank you. I would just wanted to add something that John alluded to about um, having the confidence in what you're doing based on um, working with your peer to peers to then go to your landowner and say, you know, I'm not the only one trying this. Um, there are other folks out here. Here's where my technical assistance is coming from. Here's where the research has been and getting um, the landowner comfortable with what you want to what you want to try to do. Sometimes I've heard um, some uh, farmer friends talk about that the landowner will suggest making a conservation change, and it may not be appropriate for where you are or where you live, but they're a bit removed, and um, it's having the confidence in your own system and building your own system so you can work through some of those challenges with those folks who are who are um, you're in partnership with. That's great. Anna, you've got uh, your work cut out for you. Um, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, everyone's uh, done a really great job of highlighting how farming is both this really data intensive, you know, uh, uh, like technologically advanced field and also a real cultural hotbed where you really want to be doing things with the support of your peers and with the support of the ecosystem of retailers and uh, consultants and local government that you work with. Just so everyone knows, I did not grow up on a farm. I've had to learn all of this. Um, I grew up in the western suburbs of um, Minneapolis where we thought the burpees catalog was agriculture and a rotary hoe was a square dance. So 
this is my husband's family. And so I contend that I'm a better partner in this business because I didn't grow up here and I ask a lot of questions. Um, he will not tell you the same thing most days. No, I'm kidding. He will. But um, yeah, so it's a, it's a learning process for all sorts of people. <laughs> That's great. Um, there are questions coming in from the audience and we'll transition there soon. This is just a reminder to those of you who are tuning in, please uh, feel free to submit your questions. Um, you can tweet at, at MN Agriculture or you can send an email to mda.communications at state.mn.us. And thank you to those who've been submitting questions. We've lot of, got a lot of good ones. So um, we'll, so we'll, we'll hit those here soon. But I did want to um, kind of circle back to something, Kristen, that you mentioned that I think sort of ties um, together bits and pieces of what you've all been mentioning. And, you know, there's this, this data piece, there's this cultural piece, um, and then there's this understanding our impact. So uh, we've talked about like what's working um, and this being some of this is new or we're, we're talking about culture change, systems change, experimenting with new ways of doing things, um, new types of you know, cover crops, for example. And I'm wondering sort of what how we're measuring impact and, and what farmers are doing to sort of build that business case or or what are things that would be useful um, to help articulating and making this business case. Um, and so I'd love your insights there. And then and maybe, John, you can sort of comment on, like, what is the role of, of the state and of Bowser and others in sort of helping to advance that business case or to collect the information that um, incentivizes it? Yes, but also, you know, helps us understand what we're doing, what's working and what are what are the benefits and what are the trade offs and costs? So mm -hmm. I'll kind of throw that multi part maybe vague question out there for anyone to catch. And then you could maybe toss it between one another. But yeah. How we measure our impact. Thanks. So that's a tough one. But I think one of the things we do, and I can only talk about what, um, you know, happens at our operation on this one. Our impact, of course, is just doing a, as best job as we can with uh, some of our mapping software and looking at what have we put uh, and layering all the practices and operations that go on top into a comprehensive map, map and set of charts. You know, a lot of people think that farmers spend the winter um, doing nothing or going to Miami, wrong. We are here with charts and maps and um, agronomy teams and input suppliers really digging deep into, okay, this is what we know has happened. Um, we're very, very, very lucky in that um, we use an agronomy staff and soil scientist company to help assist us with that. And they do everything from helping us write prescriptions of how we're going, what we're going to do on the landscape to nutrient management with manure application and then assigning a cost to it. Um, how much does it cost us to do this and what's the return at the end? Um, we work um, closely with our lender to try to, um, and it's not his fault, the poor guy. I drive him crazy sometimes reminding him that the practices that are make that we are doing and my neighbors are doing are making us less vulnerable to to um, flooding disasters dryness because we are building a resilient um, system out here so you know you um, measuring that impact can be um, can be overwhelming at times but you look towards those trusted advisors to help you do it and then you just, um, hope it works. I'm not going to tell you we've had 100% success on that kind of measurement, but every season um, is a, a try it and then analyze it in in this um, in the winter time to see what we're going to do next. Remember too, we're in a situation now in agriculture that we've already made some decisions based on availability of of seed on what we think our market impacts for next year. So just we are going to finish planting tomorrow and we already know what we're planting next year within, you know, 30 percent is probably up for grabs. So that's the time element of what we're doing, too. And that's because there's certain seed and certain things we want to do. Um, uh, getting ready for cover crops right after harvest, you have to be ready because the window in Minnesota is short. So you've got to be planning um, what the, could this look like. And one of the things that I instill with the folks at the university every time I get a chance is 
let's develop a cover crop seed with a coating on it so we could plant it in the spring and then the coating would disintegrate and um, be ready for fall. Okay, Anna, could you do that next week? We'll have to get my plant breeding colleagues on that one. <laughs> Maybe inspiration from the prairies. I think that was a yes, so yeah, that's good, Anna. <laughs> That's the next research proposal. Does anyone want to add any comments to that to that, or add to Kristen's insights um, before we transition to audience questions? We've got some good ones coming in. Well, just so you I can add, you know, I think maybe people don't quite understand the scale of things too. You know, I mean, uh, just on Kristen's farm, you know, you, you talk about managing risk, right? Every piece of equipment they have, at least the major ones that, you know, these are the things that cost more than most people's homes, right? I mean, it's that's the kind of scale that just one farm and, and most farms are at, honestly. And Minnesota's a very big state, right? If we drive from where Lance is, you know, up to Hallock, you know, that's going to you know, pack a suitcase, right? Because you won't be able to get there and back, right, in, in a day. And so, and the whole way, you will see nothing but farmland. And so we and that's very, very rich soil. I mean, compared to other parts of our country and for sure the world, that that, that part of of the globe is probably the most productive in combination with the water availability of any place in the world. And we need to make sure we take care of it. So, but the scale of this is really, really important for people to understand. And, you know, you have to talk others into taking some of this risk on too. You know, Kristen mentioned lenders and, you know, every year a farmer has to go in and talk somebody into bankrolling, you know, all these upfront costs that they have to have to, in order to generate a crop at the backside of the season, right? So um, what we can do in the policy area is is help a little bit of that by, as we said earlier, you know, reducing some of that um, risk, or at least making it more predictable, right? Uh, uh, and and that's you know that's our role, I guess, both at the state level and the federal level in terms of providing the funding. And then in, you know Lance's work is to you know talk people into trying this on their property, you know, and and that help that comes with his expertise, along with a portion of offsetting the cost of the materials, for example, and sometimes equipment too. Although, you know everybody wants the same equipment at the same time. So it's a little bit harder to share that, right? Because the windows of opportunity are are prescribed very tightly. And Kristen said she knows what they're going to plant next year. You probably also know within a matter of a week when you're going to be harvesting, right? I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely known when you're going to have to do that, right? And so uh, these things are all, you know, again, uh, important when we talk about the scaling up of this over uh, over the next, you know, hopefully not too many years, but uh, decades maybe is probably what it's going to take to be truthful about it. So I'll turn it back to you, Heidi. Great. Thank you. All right. We're going to pivot to some audience questions and I'm going to take them in the order that they've been um, handed to me. So in no particular, you know, they're, we're going to bounce around here from topic area, but um, I really like this question. Um, this is a question that came in from Twitter. Um, what can the average person do to help improve or to advocate for healthy soil? Well, you know, most people don't probably own a farm and that's, 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 uh, you know, clear, but, you know, healthy soil in a yard is also possible, right? I mean, the, as Anna talked about soil structure, right? You know, when soil gets overly compacted, right? It loses its ability to generate, unfortunately or unfortunately, the stuff that you want to grow. And sometimes it allows the things you don't want to go to grow better. Uh, so, and and being careful about applying nutrients, you know, if if even needed, right? I mean, and this is more maybe of a turf grass question. And, and there is university has a very, a uh, well put together program and a bunch of advice about that too. So I would encourage people who are interested in, you know, how to take care of their lawn, for example, in a way that supports healthy soil to check with the University of Extension and their turf grass people have given a great deal of thought and research into that as well. I'd also point out a more policy route, you know, the one watershed, one plan process that's unrolling around the state of Minnesota often involves soil health components. So when one is happening in your area, you can go to a lot of those open meetings and advocate for soil health practices to be a part of the long term plan for your watershed. Great, thank you. Um, I want, yeah, I'm just thinking, huh, maybe I should think about my grass, but I'm trying to go like prairie, 
I don't really, I don't know. I'm, I'm lazy, <laughs> but prairies are hard too. You've got to, anyway, oh, I want to advocate too. So I got, this is a multi-pronged approach for me. Um, <laughs> so um, the next question um, is uh, one that maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Anna, um, and then we can go around the room and, and other folks can, can contribute here. So the question is, is the science sufficiently robust for us to accurately or reasonably determine how much carbon we can sequester in soils um, with different best management practices and, and you know, how much is needed for the effort to be worth the investment in terms of sort of a climate change remediation solution? I know that's probably a big question. I know an active area of research, but maybe you can give us the sort of high level, um, your high level insights. Sure. Uh, so I have measured carbon in agricultural system, and so I think it can be done. But it does take a lot of effort, and it takes time. You have to uh, have people essentially measuring on a pretty regular basis over a pretty long period of time if you want to see change in carbon. So the science is there, but it's not probably as fast as... Um, some of the markets would like it to be if you want to say, well, we're going to fund a practice for two years and see the carbon change. That kind of um, plan makes me a little bit nervous because I know that soil changes slowly. You know, it developed over millennia and a practice you put in this year isn't likely to always have a measurable change in something like soil carbon. So the uh, and the more robust the markets are, the more trustworthy and also the higher the price of a carbon credit, the easier it's going to be to accomplish the kind of verification we need to of soil carbon across the landscape. Just to um, add a little bit to what Anna's saying, and she's exactly right, this takes time. And right now, I think, um, as I counted yesterday, there's probably... 10 or 11 different platforms that or programs that farmers and engage can engage in um, regarding carbon and carbon sequestration and rewards for some of that but i caution my peers about really looking at them to see what it involves because it's not going to happen overnight and what are you giving up um there are um platforms out there that will want you to um, hand over some data and it may not be what you want to do or to make a commitment for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, or to do a look back at practices that you have accomplished to see where you've been. And I really will tell you that um, we can do this, but it's not quite there yet. So really look carefully at what um, you're engaging in. The science will come. It's just going to take some time. Heidi, maybe I can just more, more generally, you know, the, the word carbon credit was mentioned and, and Kristen responded to kind of how it's been working. And it's just getting this idea of a credit in essence as an offset that a farmer may be able to receive some, some compensation, some payment, right, from some other party you know at this point most of it is from corporations you know that are trying to reduce their carbon footprint and you know have limited ability to do it within the the infrastructure and operations that they have so they're going to in essence pay someone else to provide some of that offset and and there's been uh, basically a private sector market established although it's a little chaotic as we kind of expect in the beginnings of such things. Uh, these aren't just Minnesota, they're, they're national, maybe even beyond, right? Uh, these aren't credits that are required necessarily. I mean, there are some of those very few situations I know that, uh, particularly out in California where they do require some some corporations or, or permittees, I guess, to, uh, to offset. But in Minnesota, it's really all about people who are trying to do it on a voluntary basis. And so, um, now that said, you know, that is probably not the driver of how all of this hopefully will get accomplished in the future. You know, the idea is that if if it done well and done in a way that, you know, can demonstrate its direct benefits to the landowners, the farmers or their land they're getting from someone else, that there's a productivity, a an asset enhancement benefit to the soil being taken care of well. Um, we hope that that's going to, you know, be enough. You know, maybe some of the other things would be, you know, a bonus, I would say, but they shouldn't, uh, in my opinion, anyway, be the driver. And maybe I'm getting into the policy area a little bit, but 
if people you know have opinions or want to you know offer comments around the policy as well, uh, certainly you know your your local you know people are a good place to start. You know, Salem Water Conservation District folks are in your community or the county board. You know, people like that are very interested in probably hearing from you. And I know that a lot of the ag organizations are supporting this work too. And and Christian's an organized member of several of them. Um, uh, they see the value in doing this for farmers, you know, and so uh, we hope that that's the trend that continues. Great, thank you. I think, you know, one of the very real tensions is sort of, um, we hear on one hand from the sort of climate science community, right, like we can't act fast enough. And then this reality of understanding that we have to act, but we have to also act in a way that, <laughs> brings us all along, right? And that is, um, I don't know, I guess just adopting all the real realities, the on the ground realities of, of implementation. That's not to say we can't, we don't need to really think about how we move, how we move fast and we move, you know, in a, we move right, I guess. Um, but the reality um, is is really hard. And if, if we, if we think back to sort of, Anna, how you started with this idea that, you know, all these, wherever, even I think on a farm, the soil characteristics themselves are are different. And so the potent, when we're talking about sequestration potential, things like that, it's not, there's no real one size fits all, right? And I think this is the challenge. There's no one farm, one solution fits all, right? That we benefit from the diversity of what we all do, that we are all taking on different types of risks, different characteristics of risk, yet we're all experiencing this change in our climate system and you know needing to both be enhance our resilience and reduce our emissions right these are the kind of climate imperatives and soil health isn't an, isn't a gateway and an opportunity to have a conversation really about both and how you do both in tandem but also that very real reality of there being it's a it's a complex equation and it's one that needs to be data driven um, and there need to be incentives. This isn't really a question, but more of a comment on sort of just the complexity of what we're trying to do as we all move into this direction of, of you know, wanting to care for the land, wanting to protect our environment. Um, and the ways we do that is, you know, it's a diverse set and suite of options. So um, I think... I just Oh, I was just going to add, Heidi, that I have this wonderful colleague at the Meridian Institute who says sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. You know, as we look to change a tillage practice, what are the what's the impact of that? Um, not only on the landscape, but on our bottom line. I, and then what does that tillage practice mean for the entire landscape that we work on? So you're right. Sometimes you do have to or John, my friend John is right. You go slow to go fast. And I think that this is also part of the appeal of soil health is that it can join some of these different ideas. You do see these public benefits of soil health practices that we've talked a lot about, but you also see private benefits that feed right into uh, uh, the individual farm's operation. And because working in soil joins those two pieces and you can potentially have this benefit for both parties, uh, soil health is such an appealing concept and I think that's why it's taken off so much in the last few years. Thanks Anna. Um, we're nearing the end here but I, I'm gonna at the risk of um, people being mad at me who are monitoring the time here I'm gonna pose one question that I'd like each of you to answer. Um, rapid fire this is meant to be a quick response sort of off the cuff. Um, so we entered this and I know I've learned a lot. I've got pages of notes that I've been taking here as I've been learning from the four of you. Um, and, and also in the side here as, as questions have been coming in and in the chat, you know, someone mentioned that, you know, another option when we think about how, how does everyone show up in this conversation around uh, soil health? And that was very simply to talk about it, to have a question, you know, have conversations about soil health and our connection to soil um, with the different people with whom we are networked and with whom we have trust. Um, and that's a similar parallel when we talk about climate change and having climate conversations is a critical climate action, right? We need to start talking about why we care about this issue. So my question to you that I'd like each of you to answer as we close out our time together this evening is if you were, you know, pick someone that you care about that you're talking to um, that maybe is like me and doesn't know a whole lot about soil health, but is interested, what's the one thing 
that you wish I knew um, about soil health and, and why I should care. And maybe it's sort of this idea of, you know, we need to go slow to go fast. Like, how, how do we move forward together? And what do I need to know in order to help you um, do the important work that you do? Any takers to kick off? As you all roll your eyes at me thinking, Heidi, how dare you? <laughs> I'll start with a basic one, because this is what I always think is soil health doesn't have to be complex. We just have to hold our soil in place. You can see it blow across the landscape in a dry year. You can see it flow across the landscape in a wet year. All of that is a problem. And if we could keep it there where it started, that's a great start. Perfect. Thanks for kicking, up, kicking us off. Lance, I'm going to go to you because we haven't heard from you very much <laughs> lately. Yeah, sure. Well, um, so I would say that just making the connection that taking care of our soil really impacts all of us because, you know, I want, you know, I have five little kids. I want them to be, you know, eating healthy, nutrient-dense foods and, you know, having a healthy lifestyle, you know, and I want their kids to be, you know, having that same healthy lifestyle. So, understanding and having a, a desire to keep learning about the importance of soil and how it's connected, you know, where our food comes from, that type of thing is how I would, how I'd answer. So. Fantastic. I'll go next and let John um, be the, uh, the ending thing. Um, I would say a lot of times we need to let people know that it's soil, not dirt. Soil is a living breathing, complex thing that, like Anna says, we just want it to stay here and be the nurturing thing that uh, my Pat's and my generation are going to hand off to Gabe and Ben, who are our next kids, and Sam and Claire, our, our four children. So um, just know what it is and know what um, how important it is to the whole system is uh, – probably the biggest thing I, I would want folks to know. Thank I would you. say, you know, try it. And before you try it, find somebody who's tried it before you. And, uh, you know, you'll find your way to someone who can give you some insights and, and hopefully some inspiration and, and hopefully, you know, a way to get going on your own. But uh, as Zana said, it's not that complicated. The reason we're doing it is pretty simple. And hopefully the way you do it is actually not that complicated either. Find someone like Lance that can help you and you'll be fine. Great. Well, thank you all for that. Um, again, I know I learned a ton and um, you gave me a lot of food for thought and I'm going to start practicing my why I care about soil and its importance pitch now. I'm going to practice this evening when I go and talk to my my partner and my child. So one, one soil conversation underway shortly. Um, and before you all go and have your own soil health conversations with those around you and those you love, I will pass it back to John, who will close us out for the evening. Um, but thank you so much to all of the panelists for your insights, for your stories, for your perspectives, and for the work that you do every day. Um, to improve our soil health and our climate resiliency across the state of Minnesota. Well, thanks uh, to all the panelists for spending an hour with each other and, of course, with the audience as well. It's been very insightful. I think for me it was anyway, so hopefully the rest of you also gain something from it. Um, if you are someone who's interested in the policy part of it, you know, certainly, uh, you know, talk to policymakers. If you're someone who's interested in the practice, aspects of it, you know, talk to somebody locally who can help you. I mean, I, uh, our website at the Board of Water and Soil Resources could be a start with that. There's also a good bit of information at the University of Minnesota Office for Soil Health. I think that's also a great resource. So see what you can find and go from there. And again, thanks everybody for joining in. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. One note, this is Maggie Winger from the Pollution Control Agency. I want to invite everyone to join us for the Environmental Quality Board event with the Emerging Environmental Leaders talking about youth and climate next week, May 19th, same thing, six o'clock on YouTube. You can find the link and all other events and sign up for emails on future climate events at mn.gov forward slash climate. Um, thank you for joining us tonight and have a lovely evening. <laughs>